What's up, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Florida Moto Talk. Today, the layout's going to be a little bit different. Uh, Tristan's not going to be joining us because he's actually getting ready for a weekend at Jennings GP, so he's got a lot going on with that, getting his bike squared away and everything. And he won't have time to jump on the show this week, but he did release a pretty cool video uh, just talking about his experience buying his Ducati, and he talks a lot about how um, how much money he spent, and he put a really cool edit together. Uh, so definitely go and check that out. It's live on the page. It's been live all week, and he put a lot of work into it. Really good video, and he's definitely making me kind of step my game up with that one because he upped the production value for sure. But great video. Go check that out, and then he should be back with us next week. But for this week, we're going to do something a little bit different. And so, if you noticed, I have a, a different guest on today. His name's Tyler. Uh, he's a really old buddy of mine. We, we've been friends for a very long time now. Well, we probably met in, what, like 2010? Something like that? Maybe even before yeah, that? It would have been uh, 09. 09, look at that. Okay. 09, yep. 09. Yes, yeah, so we've been friends for a very long time. And we're normally, uh, you know, on this channel, we're talking about bikes. We're talking about racing. We're talking about bike deals. But today we're going to talk about bike racing, but a different type of bike racing, something that we have not talked about on the channel before. And we're going to talk about dirt bikes for a little bit because Tyler, for some reason, has chosen to go against the, the norms with motorcycle riding. And here in America, most people that get into road racing, they mostly start on dirt bikes. And then as they progress, they switch over to road racing. But Tyler decided to do something completely different, and he actually started, well, started on the street, right, but then started road racing, but then for whatever reason, I, we haven't figured out why, maybe he can explain it to us, but he decided to give up road racing and go start doing uh, MX racing and hair scrambles and, and things like that. So um, we're just going to talk to him today about his experience with that, and we're going to learn a little bit about dirt bike racing and Maybe he can convince somebody to, to quit road racing because he's been trying to get me to quit road racing for uh, ever since I started for about a year now. But um, how are you doing, Tyler? Can you hear me pretty good? Yeah, doing good. What's going on, man? Yeah, not not a whole lot. Um, now that we got you on here, man, just uh, just tell us a little bit about yourself, man. Like, how'd you get into riding? You know, how, how long have you been riding, and what's kind of your experience you know, with, with bikes? Yeah, man. Uh, growing up, I always loved bikes the my parents were pretty protective my mom's a medical examiner so yeah motorcycles were a hell no from a very early age uh but i got into bmx early and loved bikes always saw street bikes and wanted to get into them when i got into college i had a little bit of money saved up bought a street bike something i've always wanted didn't tell my mom didn't tell anyone uh my family I rode that for a couple years, loved it, and uh, yeah, one day I had a crash. Uh, ended up in a ditch, broke a bunch of broken bones. Um, had to call my mom, had the family hall phoned out, all that. Uh, but talking with them, they were not, they didn't want me to ride on the street, but I've always wanted to get into road racing. So I took my crash bike, turned it into a road racing bike, and family was okay with that. Uh, got into road racing doing that as a kid i always wanted to do motocross but it just wasn't in the cards with my family got into road racing did that for uh, six seven years uh did some weira ccs a lot of track days uh had a good time with it um and yeah just uh kind of fell out of it a little bit um part of it i moved to tampa and the only tracks in florida mostly are homestead jennings both of them are Long drives, um, stayed in it a little bit, but also there's the cost, you know, when you're racing like that, a racing weekend is thousand dollars plus for tires, gas, hotel, everything. And right out of college, that kind of money I, I didn't have just to throw away. Um, but always wanted to do dirt bikes, saw an opportunity, picked up a dirt bike and started riding, uh, started getting into some motocross uh and the cost to go and ride was a lot more affordable uh it's something i could do two three times a week uh every week 
road racing was always kind of a once a month at most thing. So to get out there and ride that often was awesome. Uh, met a lot of friends, kept getting better. We all as a group started improving, trying different things, motocross, racing, hair scrambles, you know, a group of which we got people that started as adults. No one was, you know, a level riders, but you know, we, we were good together. Um, and loved it ever since made it through a couple different bikes, got into different stuff. And, uh, Anywhere you go, there's plenty of places to ride. I moved out to Washington uh, last year and out here, plenty of riding as well. Uh, still love it, still in it. Love the dirt bikes and haven't touched a street bike in a few years. Not against it, but the fun factors just, you know, dirt bikes, you can have a ton of fun doing all sorts of different stuff on a dirt bike. Yeah. And I'm wondering, like, how's that phone call go? where you're not supposed to have a sport bike at all. And it's like, Hey, um, I'm actually like <laughs> half alive right now. <laughs> so long. There's a long story behind that whole, how that whole day went. Uh, but yeah, I crashed a bunch of broken stuff, went to the hospital. They kept tell- asking me, Hey, who do you want to call? And I kept telling them, I, I don't want to call anyone yet. And they're well, you're not going home like this. You have to call someone. I'm in, Gainesville going to college, University of Florida. My mom's in Tallahassee. It's about a two and a half hour drive. But I'm putting it off going through my head. Hey, how am I going to explain this to my mom? And funny story, I, I had a plan. What I was going to do was I was going to tell her I was in an accident. I wasn't going to tell her bike. I was going to tell her accident. And uh, hopefully that kind of, and I was wearing a full leather race suit, helmet, gauntlet gloves. I, I was wearing all the year, all the track day year. Um, and they had that in my room in the hospital. So when she got there, she'd see that. And, you know, hopefully this kind of evens everything over. Hey, look, I was being safe. I got hurt, but I'm fine. I'll, you know, nothing's too bad. I I was safe. Uh, so finally I'm like, yeah, yeah. My arms, the, all the muscles were pulled. My collarbone was broken, shoulder blade. I couldn't lift either arm up. So to call, I was going to need someone to hold the phone next to my ear. So the nurse comes in. I finally tell her, yeah, yeah, here's my mom's phone number. Can you give her a call? And I told her, just call her, put the phone next to my ear. I'll explain it to her. She knows where Shans is. She'll come. So the nurse calls the number, puts it next to her ear. And I'm thinking, oh, oh, shit, this, no. She puts it next to her ear and goes, hey, uh, Lisa, my mom's a medical examiner. She knows Shans. It's a very popular hospital. Hey, this is nurse whoever with Shans. We have your son here in the ICU. He was in a motorcycle accident. You see this nurse's face is drained. You know, I know my mom's just yelling on the other side. Is he alive? Oh my God. What happened? She, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Here he is. Puts the phone next to my ear. You bitch. Uh, <laughs> it's just screaming. Hi, <laughs> hey Tyler, whose bike was it? Uh, yeah, I'm fine. Uh, yeah, bike. Yeah, let, let's just talk about that when you get here. So, yeah, she comes. We talked about it. She had to take me to pick the bike up from the salvage yard. It looked like a crumpled up soda can. Uh, but she saw the gear I was wearing. We, she was okay. But yeah, it was a interesting day. She wasn't happy, but yeah, it was it was a shock. But growing up, she knew that I was very much a. Uh, forgiveness permission i was going to do some crazy stuff and likely not tell anyone it wasn't much of a surprise but she was surprised yeah and that if i remember you telling me about that that was like the same day that you had bought your first leather suit right uh no i had a leather suit for quite a while i around that time i bought a new helmet but uh yeah i had a leather suit since i was in tallahassee i was riding pretty often with the uh leather suit yeah yeah, I just remember you telling me, I guess, like, when the paramedic showed up to cut it off. Oh, <laughs> yeah. To cut the suit off for you. <laughs> uh, I, that whole day, uh, I could go on on and on about that day. But, yeah, uh, I had a pretty bad concussion, and I knew the when the paramedics got there, they, they were going to cut everything off. So I had the suit kind of hanging down around my waist, um, waiting for them to show up. I, they were about 30 minutes away. I was going to be there for a while. I'm walking around talking to 911. I have a concussion. I think at some point they told me, okay, just hang out on the phone so we can track your GPS. But I forgot all about it. So all I know is I'm on the phone with 911, but no one's responding to my words. So I don't know what the hell's going on there. It, Yeah, concussion screws with your head. But 
leather suits hanging around my waist. No one's around. I'm in the middle of nowhere. I'm uh, whatever. I'm wearing underwear. So I, I remove my boots, remove my one piece suit. I'm in my boxers and t-shirt walking around in the road on the phone. And, uh, yeah, paramedics, when they got there, they were not very excited to see a, uh, a guy half naked walking around the middle of the road. They, <laughs> they didn't listen to me a whole lot after that point. No, not at all. And so that bike, if I remember correctly, that was the CBR 600, yeah. too, right? That you ended up converting yeah. to a race bike after that. That's the one. Very nice. Is, and that's the only bike that you raced? Yeah. Yeah, the CBR 600. I started on the SB650, um, which, you know, about rode that for six months, which is the CBR 2008 and loved it. It was a great bike, converted to a race bike, had it raced with it for the six, seven years until I eventually sold it. That was my baby, put a lot of money into it. I wasn't out to change bikes. Uh, it was a great bike for me. Loved that bike. No reason to change. Yeah. So you, you raced that one for a couple of years and now how long have you been racing um, motocross and doing the hair scrambles? I got into dirt bikes in 2015. Um, getting into it, I knew it was dangerous and yeah, so I, I didn't get into it with the int intention to race. I kind of just wanted to do some trails, maybe putt around on a motocross track, but the intention wasn't to race. But the more I got into it, uh, and the really convenient thing, Tampa MX at the time, I was lived about 15 minutes away from there. And every Tuesday night, they had a motocross school. You went there, all age groups, all skill levels. So I started going there. I figured, okay, they'll teach me how to turn and do that. So started doing that got comfortable on that track and started getting into racing just the beginner class you know really started enjoying that so okay it's you know i have the skills to not get hurt but the whole time i was in florida i never actually did any hair scrambles my friends kept trying to get me to do hair scrambles but every uh, we had a facebook group that we all talked on uh messenger group there's about 20 of us and the guys that did the hair scrambles they kept trying to convince me and a few other people that weren't doing hair scrambles to go do hair scrambles. But every Monday, the day after they did their race, was just bitching and moaning about how horrible the track was, how muddy it was, how awful it was, how tired, dusty, how how miserable it was. And I'm like, you guys aren't selling me on this. I don't what you've described. I don't want to experience I, I, the motocross track. It's nice. It's groomed. It's good. But doing a two hour race in the mud sounds like an awful experience so i didn't get into it when i moved to alabama um eventually you know there was a series going around i had a friend up there and all right i'll give one a try Let, let's see what this is all about went did it i was exhausted it was muddy it was terrible i loved every second of it I'm like all right i get it this all right this this makes sense now and did the whole season raced it all out about once maybe twice a month there was a race and i made every single one of them from then on they weren't all that muddy they weren't all miserable and started getting the hang of it all right this is yeah this is good uh moved out to washington last year i did probably 15 to 20 hair scrambles this last year didn't do any motocross races that's kind of the direction i've gone at this point uh, sweet what and I guess since we're on the topic, what I mean, I've I've seen like motocross on TV, and I understand like what hair scrambles are, but for for the people that don't, I mean, what what's the difference between MX and hair scrambles, and um, you know what what's the benefit to doing e either one? I guess. So motocross is more of a sprint race. At the amateur level, your a race is anywhere from. I've been in races as low as three laps and maybe six, seven laps at most. They're anywhere from six to 10, 15 minutes. Um, but it's more of a sprint race. Um, you're all lined up on a gate. We've all watched it. Gate drops. Engines are revved. You drop the clutch. Everyone goes in a line. It's very close contact for that first couple of turns. Um, you obviously get the jumps. It's a man-made, you know, terrain with, jumps and bull turns and man-made they're groomed they start out groomed but after you have enough bikes go across they end up ruddy ruddy bumpy but they're man-made terrain a hair scramble is anywhere from an hour to two and a half hours depending on your class and race 
uh, raised through the woods. Usually it's a couple, you know, about 10 miles, give or take. Uh, it, it's more of an endurance race. So in there, you start with a dead engine most of the time. Uh, so when the start occurs, you're not all in a line funneled into a group. It's a little bit more spread out, a little safer of a start. Um, and you have two hours. So there's not as much of a need to pass someone immediately if you catch them. And if someone catches you, you don't have to worry as much about them taking you out. Because if they're stuck behind you for two minutes, it's not the end of the world. Motocross race, someone's a lot more likely to do something stupid and pass you. You also get a lot more kids in the you know beginner C class. You're going to be racing 15, 16 year old kids that don't care about getting hurt, don't have to go to work on Monday. Uh, the, and if they're stuck behind you, they're going to find a way to pass you, whether it's safe for you, them, or anything. Air scrambles, I'd say, are for the most part a little safer. People are a little bit more tame, respectful. It, but the endurance factor, you're racing most most of the time. It's an hour and a half to two hours. It's a dirt bike. It has a motor, but you get exhausted. Uh, usually within the first 15, 30 minutes, you're already starting to, you know. Yeah. Start huffing and uh, puffing and get your heart rate up. <laughs> oh, yeah. and more you, More so than road racing? Oh yeah, a lot more. Look, yeah, road racing was easy compared to dirt bikes. But with the hair scrambles, you don't have to worry about jumps either, though, right? No. Uh, a couple of the hair scrambles might go onto a motocross track. Mm -hmm. So one of the 10 miles might be on a motocross track. Usually if they're doing that, they'll tame down the jumps, uh, cut the lips off so you can... If you go... a over them with a good amount of speed, you're probably not going to kill yourself if you case it. They tone the track down, but there's some jumps if you want to do them. If you can do them, you have an advantage. If you mm -hmm. can't do them, you're not guaranteed a loss. Hmm. Uh, and 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 with like the MX tracks, I'm wondering, so do they change those tracks around a lot or, or are the tracks pretty much the same for, you know, where you're like what facility you're at? Now, the, so that's one of the great things and one of the reasons why I love motocross that, you know, road racing, Jennings, you went there 20 years ago and you go there five years from now, it's the same track. Every time I went to Jennings was the same track. Mm -hmm. uh, so one example, Tampa MX, it was probably on maybe a two acre plot of land. It was kind of small. They did more of a supercross style. It was a lot of jumps tight, uh, but two or three times a year. They would level it and build a new track and at least once a month they would change something on it they might connect turns to a different straightaway they might level a straightaway and make a different jump combination they would do something but almost every time you went there there was something different you and at most you might go there three four times uh with the same track layout before something changes. It's always changing. Some tracks don't do it as much. Uh, some of the big national tracks, they're kind of built into the terrain. They're more limited, but they still find ways to change it. And with the, you know, it, with motocross, with a bulldozer and a week of time, you can build a new motocross track with road racing. If you wanted to build a new Jennings, you're looking at a couple million dollars and a lot of heavy equipment and mm -hmm. probably a couple months of time. So it's a little different, but yeah, that's one of the good things about motocross is each track is different almost every time you go to it. If you, it, it, it keeps the challenge alive. And, you know, Tampa MX, I was racing there for, you know, several years and there was more than a dozen different tracks that I rode at that location. It was, you know, it, it kept, it was fun. Sometimes they changed it and I hated it for a couple of weeks till I figured it out. Sometimes they changed it and it was amazing. And yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's mm. a completely different track today than it was when I first started. Yeah. Now I'm wondering because like this past weekend I raced with the, uh, the Sepurano, the endurance races at Jennings. And um, we did a couple um, of the three hour races and for the second round of, um, of racing it was it was at jennings so the the first three hour race was just normal jennings um but the second race was in reverse and mm -hmm. it was pretty much in an, a whole new track yeah and so I, we did a friday practice um that saturday before the race but 
I was probably on the bike for maybe like, you know, just a handful of laps, maybe, maybe on the bike for like 15, 20 minutes, the way that things worked out with the team and everything. Hardly enough time to learn the track, but I was still able to race it, not fast. And mm-hmm. I'm wondering, like, how long does it take you to learn, like, a, a new MX track when you show up somewhere to, to race for a weekend? It's it, it depends on the track, for sure. Uh, but anytime you go to a new track, whether you've been to that facility but a new layout or you go to a brand new track for the first time, yeah, the first time you go on the track, don't jump anything. Just cruise it, learn the track, look at the drums, scope it out, see what's see what you can go for. If there's a medium sized tabletop, all right, whatever. I can hit that with whatever speed next time, and I'm not going to kill myself. All right, here's a big gap double, 60 foot wide. I probably don't want to come up to that this next lap and start working your way up. But mm-hmm. uh, yeah, there's some tracks that you come up to that are new that are just very intimidating uh others are more uh, i'll say beginner friendly where you can figure it out pretty quickly that nothing here or maybe there's just one thing that's big but for the most part nothing here is going to kill me so one that comes to mind in central florida was uh barto it was more of a sand track but everything was a tabletop You make it around the track one time, you see, all right, everything's a tabletop, nothing's going to kill me, you can come around lap two and and gun it, um, and you overjump it, it's not the end of the world, you case it by, you know, a couple feet, it's not the end of the world, and start figuring out. Other tracks like Tampa MX, they did have a lot of, like, gap doubles where you kind of have to figure it out. You're going to roll it a few times, maybe follow someone that is jumping it, figure out what kind of speed it takes and the more experience you get the easier it is to jump those new jumps when i started it it was a lot harder to gauge those but the more experience you get i can see certain doubles now that i would never have jumped the first you know year or two i was riding i can see them now in that second lap okay yeah it's a 30 foot double it's not the end of the world if i case it it then go for it so it, it's kind of a comfort and that risk versus reward thing i'd say um but it's very different than road racing i've rode jennings one time backwards and yeah completely different track you had a lot of reducing radius turns you had a lot of sharp turns that weren't sharp in the normal direction and you kind of have to take a step back and relearn the whole track it's very different on a road racing track because on a motocross track it's not a the turns aren't as technical you can see the whole turn you can kind of gauge how much speed you should take into the turn you can see the rut and the angle of the rut the turns aren't the complicated part road racing the straights aren't the complicated part anyone can go straight and leave the throttle wide open it's the turns it's the breaking points on a motocross track it's less about the turns and the breaking points you need to do those good you need to get the skills and there are lines and all that stuff but you can screw up a turn pretty bad and be okay. And, but it's the straightaways and the jumps that are the complicated part, I'll say. And on the pro level, it's very different. Depends on what level you're racing on, but for a beginner rider or even a lower C class rider, it's, it's those straightaways, the turns, take the inside, take the outside, screw the rut up. You might lose a half second. It's not the end of the world. It's the straightaways you're figuring out. Yeah, and I don't know that concept of of like racing and jumping is just is the like the, it looks fun, but it's, it seems like just the strangest thing, right? How you can like you look at a jump and then you just gauge how fast you need to be going, like <laughs> kind of on the fly, right? And, and yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, I was just gonna say I feel like that can like there's so many things that can throw up like or just mess up your whole sense of speed too, right? Like if you've got somebody that's in front of you kind of obstructing your vision or somebody bumps you going into the jump or something like that, it seems like there's a lot that can go wrong when it comes to, to clearing gaps like that, right? And yeah, this it's a, you know, we don't have a whole lot of time to talk about a complicated subject. I'm sure some of the, what I've already said is going to drive people crazy because <laughs> yeah, it, it's, uh, yeah, the straightaways, the jumps, there's not a whole lot you're, of time if, if everyone's jumping straight away mostly everyone's going the same speed the turns are where the times met the time difference is and where 
the passing is done and that's where the racing is done. So yeah, what what I've said is kind of grain of salt. I'm worth talking like a practice day, but yeah, the straightaways, um, depending on the track. Yeah. Oh, what's a good way to say it? Try, trying to put it into words. Uh, I, mean, I mean, it depends on the jump. Some of those big jumps that I haven't been comfortable jumping are the difference maker. That's why I lose the race because I don't want to case the 60 foot double and the 16 year old kid next to me that doesn't have a job. He doesn't give a shit. He's going to jump the thing and he just made, you know, three, four seconds on me and he's going to win the race. If everyone's jumping, there are things you can do on the jumps, you know, scrub, try to stay a little bit lower, going up to a jump, depending on how you're on the throttle and how you preload and all that can affect how, how quickly you can get across the jump. So there are technical little things you can do to make it across jumps faster or slower or farther. And all that does play into it, but the turns in a motocross race are where the passings done is where the difference maker is uh yeah. it, it's very different it's hard to explain until you yeah do it but yeah the jumps it, it does add a different feature to the racing which is different you know you you're road racing you go to robling road or somewhere with a long three-quarter mile straightaway that's what 30 or 20 seconds of just wide open throttle hang there put your head down look around nothing's going on just let the bike work yep if you have a half three quarter mile straight away in a motocross track that's going to be a lot of work you're putting in that's going to be a lot of jumps a lot of whoops a lot of something going on keeping keeping it interesting areas you can make up speed so it's it's very different to compare it to road racing yeah and being that you've done both and and now hearing you talk about like motocross racing like so in depth i mean i i don't see that mx racing is safer but i mean wh which one do you think would would be safer at the end of the day hair scrambles mx or, or road racing i mean it's apples oranges i'd say uh yeah you know you go to a motocross race more than likely someone's taking an ambulance right out of there every time Poss Possibly more. It depends on the track, <laughs> but certain tracks, yeah. I've been to certain race days where six, seven ambulance rides out of there. Uh, oh, man. But on that same token, I've been to Roebling Road where six, seven ambulance rides out of Roebling Road where we have a you know hour stand down because they ran out of ambulances in the city because everyone's carrying racers to the hospital. Um, I mean, road racing, you have a lot higher speeds it can go a lot worse but the majority of your crashes aren't bad uh racing i think i've crashed six seven times and each time you low side you slide out it's not a big deal but you hit a wall you start you high side start tumbling you hit another rider at those kinds of speeds it can go bad quickly and your bones can break quickly motocross you're going to crash you're going to drop the bike far more often. You're going to have probably, I don't want to say few. No, you'll probably have more crashes, but you're going slower. And usually when you crash, it is in a turn. It's you're, you missed a rut. You, something happens and you're just watching professional motocross. Most of their crashes are in a turn. Some, they made contact. Someone missed a rut. Someone did something stupid. A few of them are on jumps, but even still you, you're jumping, you are in the air, but you're going 20 miles an hour. Would you rather, you know, fall 10 feet out of the air going 20 miles an hour or hit a wall doing 160? It's It, it depends on the uh, how it happens. But overall, I'd say motocross is – I've seen more broken bones and stuff coming out of a motocross race than I have a road racing race. Okay, but so. the injuries can be a lot worse. I haven't seen someone take trauma hawk out of a motocross race. I've seen a few okay. trauma hawk calls from road racing. Okay. So about the same level of danger then either way you look at it with both. <laughs> it, apples, oranges, I'll say. <laughs> so what was it that really motivated you then to switch, to make the full switch over to MX? Was it the safety? Uh, <laughs> no, it definitely wasn't the safety because <laughs> coming into motocross new, you're going to get hurt. You're, you're going to, 
it, it was new. I was, I'd say I was safe doing road racing. The only time I got hurt was when it was on a street bike. When, when I was actually racing, it, you know, all my crashes were low sides. I was fine. Um, yeah, it, I'd say one of the uh, big things was the cost. Um, at the time, I was making about 75000 a year, which is, you know, not bad. Uh, but doing a road racing event was, you know, $1,000 for the day. If you're talking about tires, gas, hotel, everything said and done, $1,000 is probably what you're spending on a road racing weekend. You go to uh, you go to a Daytona race, you're a step above that. With dirt bikes, I didn't get in it for that, but that's something I realized really quickly is I can go and ride for under 20 bucks certain days. I can do it multiple times a week. Road racing was always a racing was once every two or three months track days, maybe once a month. That's kind of what I was on. But even a track day was $600 at, you know, if you're doing those lap times at Jennings, if you're front expert group at Jennings, I wasn't expert racer. Um, you know, you're going through a set of tires in a day, $400 entry fees, everything said and done. You're, it just it's not something you can do every weekend. Yeah. Uh dirt biking, when I got into it, I could do it two, three times a week. I could go Tuesday afternoon to that motocross school. I could go on Saturday, Sunday, go trail riding, motocross riding. There was always something to do. And living in Tampa, within about an hour of my house was four different motocross tracks, along with a couple thousand acres at Croom. I don't know exactly how many acres, but a, a big area at Croom, I could go trail riding for free, $75 for the year. Um, but there was always something to do any day of the week you wanted to ride, and it was something, it was affordable. Um, I'd say that was one of the big things when I started doing it. I've always wanted to do it, but once I got into it, I realized how often I can do it, and I'd say that's what pulled me away from the road racing. When I started doing the dirt, going and dropping that kind of money and spending the day out at Jennings on a street bike was less appealing. It's eventually why I sold the bike because I just, I didn't have the motivation to get out there and ride. I'd much rather go to the local motocross track, $25 entry fee, $30 of gas there and back and don't have to go through a set of tires. Tires last, you know, six months or so. Yeah. So, I mean that, that does sound really appealing too, and um, as we've talked about, like I've just recently yes. discovered that there's a motocross track 30 minutes from my house too, um, yeah. a pretty big one, the um, the Southern Georgia Raceway and Training Facility, and yep. I mean it's like in my backyard, and and it's almost a crime that I don't have a dirt bike at this point because that place is awesome, and they just did some races there a couple weeks ago, and um, I went and got a, like a lot of pictures, did a made like a little video edit that I'll actually probably share on this page too, but it's, it's on my, um, my other Facebook page, my six, seven, five dreamer, but mm -hmm. it was cool just watching that too, because I mean, like you yep. said, it was the youngest people that were there were the ones that were like the most spectacular. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean like eight year old kids, I'm like, you know, 65s or whatever, just oh, yeah. hitting crazy jumps that the adults weren't hitting. And just, I mean, it it was wild to just see that stuff. And I took my kids out there too. They loved it. I ended up getting them a PW50 as well. So, yeah. I mean, yeah, it's it's definitely definitely hard to deny that that you know financially, dirt bikes is definitely the better choice, right? And I'm even yeah. hearing people say that you can race like an entire season on one set of tires. How true is that? <laughs> it depends, depends on the on series. The <laughs> depends on the pace, depends on the yeah. series, depends on the terrain, all that stuff. Uh, one thing it, with motocross, you start re you start seeing dirt differently, I'll say. I never saw dirt differently, but doing motocross, you start looking at dirt, you start looking at the ground, and you start realizing different. Uh, it, it, it's kind of weird. Uh, but, yeah, if you have a harder pack dirt, if you have, uh, you know, rocks, roots, if you have versus, you know, sand or mud, it's going to wear tires different, different paces. You know, the, mo uh, the professionals, they go through a set of tires in a, a race. They're, I mean, they're probably still runnable, but they don't run them more than one race. Amateurs, 
some of them will run a set of tires for a year. It's mm -hmm. all different. So yeah, um, that's appealing. But but how much is a set of tires? One hundred and eighty, I think. And Which, you can yeah, less than half. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and you can run this this weekend at, at the endurance race, and we didn't even buy as many tires as some people did. But for our team, for yeah. um, said for the two endurance rounds, and then for Friday practice, we bought three sets of tires, and it ended up being man, like yeah, it, it was a what like thirteen is about thirteen hundred yep. bucks for we were running Pirellis, um, these medium and soft compound Pirellis, and yeah. That hurt, that, and that was just yeah. I mean, and that was endurance racing. I mean, it is what it is, but yeah, cost of tires with road racing is bad. <laughs> yeah, Very and you bad. split that cost up a little bit, but yeah, it, it, one day out at Jennings, if you're if you're really trying to progress and you're trying to run expert pace or advanced pace at Jennings, if you're trying to run those faster times, you're going to go through tires faster, and tires are what they are. It's Four hundred dollars back when I raced. They're probably a lot more now. Um, you're gonna go through them, but you show up to some of those, and you have amateurs with a rack of wheels with tires on them, and they're going through multiple sets in a day. Like, I mean, if you want to compete in that expert class, if you want to move to that next level, if, if you want to progress, if their tires are just gonna last that much less, and but yeah, even the paces that I was running, tires at a day at Jennings were were toast. I might be able to take a front mm -hmm. to two days, but a, a rear wasn't going two days, um, and it, it was painful. And with you know, I was making okay money, I would say, but it just wasn't enough to fund doing that. It it was basically all my savings. I wasn't able to put anything to savings. Everything went to bike. So yeah financially it just yeah it wasn't sustainable long term now say like i'm i'm just some guy you know and i want to get into the dirt bike racing um i guess let's start with the bikes right like what say um uh, mm -hmm. say i want to start with hair scrambles but it, it say say i want to do both right i want a bike that can do everything what, what, what should i be looking at so when you're at an entry beginner level, uh, the bikes, the suspension, all that, it, it's kind of, it, it doesn't matter as much. The professionals, yeah, you're not going to take a super cross bike and go do a hair scramble with it. You'd be miserable and vice versa. But at a beginner level, a stock 250 is perfectly fine enough. Uh, if you're getting into it, a 250 is what you're going to want to go after. I know a lot of people, you know, Oh yeah, I can ride I, a 450. I can handle a 450. No, you can't. No, just get the 250. A 250 has more power than you would ever want in a bike. Uh, doing it doesn't matter if your hair scrambles track. A 250 is perfectly fine. Get that first. You grow out, grow it. Whatever it is, what it is, resale value is fine. But yeah. Uh, a 250 can do both on stock suspension just fine. Once you start getting into it a little bit more, I, I would say don't upgrade it too much right away. Get into it. See if you plan on going more motocross, more woods, and start seeing what on your bike feels like it's holding you back. Suspension's obviously one of the main ones, but the suspension for motocross is different than a suspension for hair scrambles. You can ask a suspension company to get you something that can do both, but it's not going to do either great. But motocross was my main thing I went after. So my bikes were set up for motocross. That's what my suspension was set up for. But I went and did hair scrambles and it was just fine. I could do the hair scramble. It wasn't beating me up. It was able to handle the ruts and the turns and the roots and all that. Fine. It would have been slightly more comfortable. I probably wouldn't have had as much, you know, as much fatigue on a straight wood suspension, but it's easier to take motocross into the woods than it is to take wood suspension into a motocross track. Across the jumps, a wood suspension is not going to do great on jumps in general. I've been to the track a lot of times with guys that brought their wood bikes and they just couldn't jump. They didn't have the preload. They didn't, they would just ride through the jumps. They would case everything. It was a pain in the ass to jump. 
but I've known plenty of people who take motocross into the woods and do just fine. But get a stock 250, go ride, spend the seat time, and spend the money upgrading what feels like ho is holding you back is the best way I would say it. If it feels like, you know, your levers could be a little bit more comfortable, your foot pegs, maybe you're slipping a little bit, your suspension, you don't feel like it's holding ruts like it should be. Spend the money there, but I wouldn't say to get a bike and just throw a bunch of money at it and hope it does what it's supposed to do. Um, but mm -hmm. a 250 stock, go ride, figure it out from there and you'll be fine. Yeah, and that's it's funny you say 250 because I remember you giving me that same speech when I was looking for my first dirt bike, mm -hmm. and I, I, I think I what did I, I ended up going with the YZ250 first, and then ended up getting the CRF 250F, the Honda. But I remember I was looking at the CRF 450s for the longest time because they were cheaper too. Yeah. And um, yeah, after getting the YZ250, I was like, yeah, that I probably would have put that 450 into a tree. Um, so yeah, definitely yeah. solid advice with the two. The two fifty is a, a a perfect size, even even for adults as as big as myself, yeah. um, or people even smaller. I mean, it, it's plenty of power. I I was never in a situation on either of my two fifties where it didn't have enough power, and um, well, except for the first time I rode it, which here in Florida, <laughs> I mean, we uh, <laughs> yeah, that was fun. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it might have been fun for you, but that was um, great. Yeah, and and you've been you've ridden everywhere, but I've only ridden here in North Florida. And here we just have we don't have any elevation, and then we have just nice sandy trails, which um, I grew to love. But my first time on the bike, like I went and bought that thing, and I had ridden it around my yard, and I was like, man, yeah, I can ride a freaking dirt bike. So then I go get up with Tyler, and we're out in the national forest. And we're at the trailhead, and it's just this this tight little sandy single track trail. It was like beach sand, and um, he's like, "You ready to go?" Like, yeah. He's like, "All right, follow me," and just womp takes off down the trail. I try to do the same thing, womp, don't go anywhere. Maybe like, what, like like fifteen minutes later, after stalling out the bike <laughs> like fifteen times and cursing at it and kicking it over, like I, I finally like put it down the trail and Tyler's just sitting there looking at me like, are we going to go riding today or what? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. funny you mentioned that. Uh, yeah. When I got my first dirt bike, I, I found a good deal in Tallahassee. So I went to Tallahassee to buy it. Uh, where you're from uh, for any of the viewers. And I wanted to go ride it that day. And that was the place that I found that was open. So I went there, I got on that and I've always, I rode, bmx bikes i was good on a bicycle i was good on a street bike i get into this deep beach sands and it just realized i have no idea how to ride a bike i get into it the bike just tips over pick it up kick start it get it running I make another 10 feet drop it kick start it make another 10 feet drop it i i don't know how to ride a bike right now i'm struggling i'm pissed off frustrated i don't want to make it very far into these woods because obviously if it's this hard to ride this thing i'm gonna to have to make it the way back so i just had this like quarter mile section to this deep beach sand just went back and forth two times exhausted took about 30 minutes to do it and i'm oh, all right yeah that's enough riding for today i'll figure this dirt bike out later on but i was dedicated to figuring out i figured it out but when you got your first dirt bike i knew exactly where we were going so to teach John a lesson here, uh, yeah, it took off. And at that point, I had figured out the sand. I knew the sand. I knew how to ride it. And the trick is just hold your momentum, give it throttle, lean back. And when the handlebars start swapping, let them lean back, squeeze your knees, drive through it. So I shot through it, made it look easy, made it to the end. I knew John wasn't coming. So I get to the end of the trail. I didn't even look back. Turned the bike off, put it against a tree, sat down and just drank some water and waited. Just, yeah, he'll be here in about five, ten minutes. Sure enough, he comes riding up. Hey, what 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 took you so long? Went and gave him the advice that probably should have given him in the given him in the parking lot, but no, nah, that was that that was uh it was worth it. 
gave him uh, the advice. All right, so here's squeeze through the knees. Here's where you're going to sit, wait, throttle. Gave him the advice. We were good the rest of the day, but that was – it was worth it to see someone else go through what I went through on my first day on a dirt bike. Yeah, and the funniest part about that is that, like, right, like shortly after that, a buddy of mine got a KX250, and I took him to the same exact spot and did the same exact thing. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> the same exact thing, but he took even longer than I did to get down the trail. But yeah, yeah. it seems it seems like a lot of people hate riding that sand, but I feel like yeah. like it definitely helped me become a better rider for sure. Like I like riding that sand, yeah. I'd, every like any sort of terrain that I did ride was just easy after learning how to handle the yeah. bike with that. And I feel like because I was also doing track riding at the time, and I feel like my track riding got a lot better too. And uh, like I remember one time in particular, I was on, I was at the track, and then I had my back end kind of step out on me and start sliding around. And normally, I feel like it would have spooked me, but when I was riding that the single track and riding the dirt bike a lot of that time, like it, it, it didn't, you know, it didn't spook me at all. I kind of just controlled it and then just kept sending it and didn't really think about it. Um, do you think there's any like benefit to? riding dirt bikes as well like probably cross training when you're um say when you're road yeah. racing yeah 100 percent um yeah I, i've seen a lot of and usually like you brought up or like first thing is most people go from dirt to street and i've seen mm-hmm. some kids that went you know they were riding dirt their whole well, growing up their whole life turn 16 18 parent gets them a bike and they go out to jennings and their first day they're doing you know, expert track times, they're doing incredible because they're used to the, you know, handling the traction and road racing. It's a lot about being on the edge of traction and, but you have a ton of it on dirt bikes. You have a lot less traction, but you learn how to handle it. So getting used to losing traction, being comfortable on a bike, being dirt bikes are, they're, they're a lot more technical, I think. When I got into road racing, it didn't seem as technical. I sit on the seat wherever I sit. My weight's wherever it's at. I learned how to kind of lean off the side of my bike and, you know, drag a knee around. But I never paid attention to if my weight was forward, weight was back. I, you know, remember the back end kicking out a few times and, you know, come off the throttle, let it come back, and then, all right, get back into it. But being comfortable in a dirt bike, being comfortable with, Dirt bikes are very sensitive to weight management. You, there are certain areas you have to have your weight forward. There are certain areas you have to have your weight back. Body position in, out, and traction. You're going to have to get comfortable without traction. Taking those skills onto a street bike, there's going to be a learning curve for sure, but you're going to have skills that no one else out there does. I mean, a fun story I'll say... Uh, one time I was out at Roebling Road, there was, I think it was, uh, who was it? Was it Melka? Greg Melka? Um, I was on the main straightaway at Roebling. I just saw the quick shifter. Something was going on. Something was shorting. My bike was kind of, so I, I wasn't going to keep pushing it. So I rode off at the end of the straightaway on Roebling and just hung out over by the banking off to the left where no one was going to hit me if they ran long. Um, the first five experts who are running on the track at the same time come around. Greg's in third. He runs wide. And if you've ever run wide on turn one at uh, Roebling, it's a big sand pit. It's that beach sand we were talking about a minute ago. Dirt bikes are hard to ride in that. A street bike's impossible to ride in that. And I watched this guy. He, you know, he was full tuck on a street bike. When he hit that sand, sat up, elbows out, leaned into it like a. He took this R6 and railed this flat beach sand just as fast as the guys who were on the track and hopped back on right behind fifth or now fourth place. He handled that sand better than I could have handled the asphalt <laughs> on racing slicks. <laughs> and it, I watched this happen. I, I'm, you had a front row seat. Trying, <laughs> trying to figure out what the hell I just watched. What what was this? <laughs> I need this. I, you know that skill. What the hell was that? 
but I mean, it, you know, I went and talked to him after the race. I, uh, what the, how, how do you do that? And he talked to him. He did the hair scrambles. He rides the dirt bikes and he, you know, kind of talked to him for a little bit, but it was that dirt skill that kicked in when he hit that sand. He's been in there. He hasn't been in there in slicks, I'm sure, but he knows how that sand is going to handle on a street bike. And honestly, if you know how to handle that deep sand, you could probably handle it better than you could grass. On a street bike, you hit grass, you stand it up, you drag the rear brake, but you ride straight. You don't touch the front, you don't try turning. Sand, it kind of develops a certain banking to it if you know how to handle it, and he knew what to do with it. And that that kind of skill, you're not going to figure out on a street bike. And I, I mean, the off-track excursions probably aren't you know, the reason why to ride street bikes, but this or ride dirt, but this guy who rides dirt was front of the pack expert racer and he's incredible. He can handle the lack of traction, but it, it a lot of why he does it, why he's as good as he is, I'm I'm sure I don't want to speak for him, is because of his experience on the dirt. Uh but seeing a lot of these young kids go from dirt to street, kill it a lot quicker than any adult is going to who's never ridden dirt and hops on a street bike yeah and that it's it's apparent too because um just watching like all the young talent like especially in moto america you know they're all riding with those high elbows like you were talking about that's kind of like the style now that that's definitely got to come from yeah either either dirt training or uh mini bike training too because i mean that's getting um, like pretty popular now mini and super moto as well yeah, but yeah, definitely benefits the cross training. So definitely, like, an even bigger benefits going from dirt bike to sport bike. But did you see any benefits going from sport bike to dirt bike? <laughs> uh, it's different. The um, I mean, I'd say I did start with some kind of leg up. If you know, riding brand new against someone else that was brand new, you know. You, basics like throttle management and clutch and shifting the basics but it's very very different in a lot of your sport bike uh habits aren't going to transfer appropriately so i wouldn't say it transfers the one way um there's some stuff that does focusing on line choice entry speed exit speeds certain stuff like that helps but you have to figure out how to handle the entry speed when you have as little traction as you have. And usually developing that skill teaches you how to handle entry speed. So it, it, there's some that you can take, but I'm not going to, I don't think you can see the same benefit getting a bunch of experience road racing and going to dirt as you would the other way around. You're not going to start on the street and become a professional motocross racer ain't going to happen you can start on the dirt and become a professional road racer you see that all the time and uh, you see a lot of the moji p guys they cross train doing dirt because of the skills they learn Uh, yeah they all do pretty much every single one of them um sweet so uh talk so let's talk about competition i I don't want to keep you here all night um because we're getting to the end here um Let's talk about like competition, right? So, say I want to go hop into a, just hop into a race right now, hair scramble or MX. I imagine that they have it broken up into different skill categories, right? So, what what are like the skill categories, and how fast would somebody need to be to compete as a beginner? You can start as, I mean, go to the track, learn to ride your bike, be able to make it around and not drop it. But most most series have a beginner class. Um, for motocross, that's where I started. They had a beginner class. Uh, my friend's dad was riding. He never practiced. He would just show up for the races. He had a dirt bike. He could go, but he wasn't jumping anything. And he wasn't getting last place. There in the back were just guys that were just putting around, happy to be there. In the front was some kid that didn't give a shit and all the other beginners in the middle. You, you don't, 
don't put yourself in dangerous situations, but most of these series have a beginner class you can join and be comfortable doing motocross. Uh, don't join a C class. Make sure they have a beginner class. Mm -hmm. And the age groups they at motocross races, they'll have a 25 and up class or a 30 and up class, something like that. Don't join those either. Uh, the, the age classes, like 25 and up, you end up with a lot of guys that almost went pro and are incredibly good. I joined one or two of those early on and just got the doors blown off. I uh, got lapped on like lap two. It, mm -hmm. Yeah, it was sad. Um, similar on the hair scramble side. Um, in the hair scramble side, you could probably go into the C class a little bit earlier. There's usually a beginner class you can get into, but C as a new rider, you could, you're probably going to be okay in the back of the pack as a new rider and not be a hindrance or a hazard to everyone around you. Okay. You, you said that was C class? Yeah. So C class is kind of the first amateur class motocross. They have a beginner where for the people that aren't comfortable jumping everything for the people getting into it because motocross, there is a big skill there's a big speed difference if you can jump everything and if you can't jump anything and they don't want them on the same track at the, on the track at the same time. C class, they're jumping almost everything. If you can jump most things, but there might be one or two that you can't jump on the track, you might be okay in the C class, but the beginner class is where you want to go and you'll figure out when you're ready for C at that point. Hair scrambles. You there's it's a 2-hour race. At some point, someone's going to be behind you. Pull over and let them by if they're obviously faster than you. But being a C, a beginner rider in the C class, isn't a big as big of a deal, I'll say, in hair scrambles. But in MX, then the skill gap is pretty huge. Oh, yeah. yeah, between <laughs> beginner and C. Now, how long can you sit in a class? Like, will they kick you out of a class if you start dominating, or what? Uh, there's plenty of sandbaggers that sit in C class for a lot longer than they probably should. I'll and those say. guys are everywhere, aren't they? <laughs> and I, it, there's a lot of really, really fast guys that could be doing really good in the B class had they if they moved up. Um, but if you're racing national C class, those guys probably aren't winning the national C class. So it, it's it's kind of complicated. If you go to your local race, though, in C-Class, there's probably one or two guys that are just going to dominate everyone and could have probably won the B-Class as well. Hmm. But most of the C-Class is, yeah, uh, they they know enough to jump, but they're not going to be the fastest guys of the track. B-Class are usually some pretty fast guys and A's basically semi-pro so then just just for the sake of comparison then from beginner class or even say from c class to a class is going to be just an astronomical difference <laughs> it, if everyone's in the class they should be in yeah and if you go to hair scrambles uh hair scrambles usually keep it a little bit closer but first place c class for some reasons usually they're running times that would put them mid to front pack B class. They probably should have gone to B class. Um, but you start looking at, you know, the average B class times versus your average C class times. Yeah, it's ridiculous what the difference is. And A class is in a whole other planet. So yeah, it, mm -hmm. it and it depends on the state, the series, it depends on a lot of different things. But in general, there's always sandbaggers, but start where figure out what uh what class you're probably meant for. Most likely, you're gonna start on beginner and C, and go from there. Figure it out. See when you start getting all first places. Probably time to start moving up. And then for for most weekends, I guess is uh with with the dirt racing, it's different from road racing in that you just pretty much just show up and you sign up and there's kind of no oversight as far as like bike tech requirements and things like that no i don't think i've ever had bike tech uh at any motocross race i've been to um 
but yeah, show up, sign up. Some of them want you to sign up for some membership to something. Some of the big races need an AMA membership, but you can do that there. Show up, sign up. You don't need road racing. You need a uh, license. You need to do your racing school. You need to get a certificate. You need to go do that before they'll let you on the track during a race. And it's a safety thing. For motocross, no. If you own a bike, you can show up and race. Uh, <laughs> just like that? And, and what, like 30, 30 bucks a race? Or? It it varies. It depends. Um, so most of the motocross races I've done, I'll, I think around like 25, 30. But usually you sign up for a couple of classes and some of them might discount it after that. So you might be paying anywhere from 70 to 90 for entry fees to do three classes at a motocross race. That's usually what I would aim for is three classes. Uh, hair scramble depends on the series, but usually maybe 60 to 90, um, depending on which memberships you need to buy and all that. But if you're in a, a state, uh, if you're in Florida doing – motocross or pair scrambles you're doing ftr you're not gonna have to buy a membership every single time it's a one-time thing i never raced ftr but it you pay for the membership you pay for your race you go out there and do it it's entry fees aren't nearly as as much as road racing road racing i remember i would do three or four classes and it'd be 400 bucks for entry fees and practice yeah. And with like the hair, I guess with both, but we'll start with the hair scrambles too. How how do you learn? Well, for one, how do you learn a two hour course? And two, like, do they is there like a practice that day before the race, or how does that work? No hair scrambles. I think FTR actually. I never did FTR, but they uh, I believe do a psych lap. But usually they're eight to twelve miles. Uh, but no, your psych laps all you get. Um, in Alabama, uh, the series is called SECA, S-E-C-C-A. And out here in Washington, there's two of them I've been running. One's NMA. One is NORCS, N-O-R-C-S. Mm -hmm. All the ones that I've done, you don't get a sight lap. Your first time seeing the track is your first lap of the race. So everyone's wow. figuring out for the first time. No one is a, No one's supposed to see the track before they're on it. So everyone should be on a fairly level playing field uh, obviously there's people that find their way out there but for the most part everyone sees it experiences it for the first time wow and what happens if you have like a mechanical hour and a half in or you have a some sort of injury halfway down the course <laughs> so yeah hair scrambles are a little little uh harder to handle that stuff because if you are in the middle of the woods and something happens you're in the middle of the woods it's mm -hmm. Most of the time, it's a 10-mile course. You'll do several laps, but you could be, you know, two miles away from the pit area where you need to make it back to, but there's woods in the way. You're not going to push your bike the rest of the course. You're going to have to find your way through. People are out there to help if things are bad. There's usually some spotters, some people that are riding the course just looking for someone that's having a problem. Um there's usually access roads to get to different places, but I've had two races where I've had a mechanical and both times I had to push my bike out of there. It sucked. I pushed my bike for probably two miles through sand, uphill, downhill. Oh, I was pissed, but I've probably done maybe 40 plus hair scramble races, maybe 50. And I've had two mechanicals, which sucks to happen. But push your bike out if you can't. Someone will find their way back there at some point to get you out. But yeah, oh, man, yeah, that's kind of a scary thought. <laughs> you just two miles into you know a mile into the woods and you have to push that thing out. Or oh yeah. man, I couldn't imagine. <laughs> Don't have a mechanical. Keep your bike uh, maintained and hope Sweet. it doesn't break down. And um, for anybody in Florida, just to go ahead and wrap up. Uh, I guess there's a website that, that you were telling me about that you can go and see all the races for the whole season and it shows the different, you know, the different tracks and the dates and everything. For FTR? Yes. For the, yeah. Yeah, the Florida series. Yeah, if you Google FTR, uh, it you should be able to find the, it's Florida Trail Riders. 
Mm -hmm. you can find their ser series and uh, shows you where they are. They're all over Florida. I think they focus mostly in central Florida, but they do hit north, south, and I think they might hit like South Georgia on a couple. But uh, yeah, I'd check out theirs. They uh, on their websites should be a rule book. Um, I'd review that a little bit, make sure that you're familiar with times, basic rules, um, fees, all that. Your first one I'd show up to with $200 in your pocket just to be safe, but you're probably not going to spend more than $100. Um, but yeah, if you have a dirt bike, I'd, you know, hit the trails, hit Kroom, hit some national forest, hit somewhere a couple times. Once you feel comfortable, yeah, going out and doing a hair scramble with FDR is, you'll be safe, you'll be good. There's good people out there that'll have your back. Um, give it a try, go have fun. It's, it's going to suck, but you're going to love every second of it. It's a weird feeling. So which is more, which is more fun at this point, road racing? or doing the dirt racing it's going to be dirt racing it's road racing was fun but yeah dirt racing i'd say is a lot more fun every every hair scramble i've done is completely different oh, man. you do road right. racing you do 10 different races at jennings they're all the same different people same track but yeah hair scrambles they keep it different every single time and a two-hour race yeah it's that endurance, yeah, trying to keep your body in shape, be able to mm -hmm. do that kind of racing, it's it's good. Sweet man. Well, uh, we'll go ahead and wrap up. I mean, we've been going for a while. Um, said so thanks for coming on, dude. That was really yeah, of good. And, um, lots of good information for sure. And we'll see, you know, in the comments if maybe you persuaded anybody to stop road racing and to switch over to dirt. But if anybody wanted to check out Tyler's page, it's it's uh, we'll link it in the bottom, and it's T. TW08C on yep. YouTube, and he's got a bunch of road race, uh, or yeah, a bunch of road race videos on there. And then you have a couple videos from Hair Scrambles, too, right? Yeah, uh, I got a couple, a uh, couple road race, Hair Scramble, and uh, mm -hmm. one motocross video, I think. Um, yeah, check it out. Sweet, yeah, go check him out if you want to see any of that. And if you have any questions or anything else that we didn't touch on, anything you're wondering about MX racing, hair scrambles, or just dirt bikes in general, just leave a um, leave a question in the comments. We'll try to get to it. But, yeah, thanks, everybody, for listening. We'll go ahead and wrap it up here. Um, thanks again, Tyler, for coming. And uh, side note, you didn't even notice my wife's butt in the back when she was crawling across the bottom of the screen, did you? No, I saw that. Yeah. It was pretty obvious, actually. Yeah. I don't even think I'll edit that out, man. Like, we're just no. going to run with that one. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely not. But, yeah, thanks, man. We'll see you next time. Yeah, of course. It was good. Thanks for having me. Yeah, man.